when I think about light and how light functions, I realize that nature's default position is diversity. Um, and it's Gardner's safe heart. I've learned this lesson over the past two decades. And indeed, there was a moment, there was an epiphany um, when I had revelations about farmscaping before I even knew the word. How many people know what farmscaping is? Okay, well, I better find it. Farmscaping is a term that was developed by Dr. Bud, E U G G, that's his real name. He's in California. And it's the conscious use of plants, right, to feed and give harborage to beneficial insects that then provide balance. I like to say balance to a riot of diversity. And that might be a little much. Um, it's a little over the top maybe to say riot of diversity. But when I think about the opposite, about the direction that is constantly being promoted by much of the scientific community, certainly by a large portion of, portion of the USDA and absolutely by the FDA, which is to reduce, sterilize, um, control nature, then I'd say I'll go with the riot of diversity. If I have to choose between the two, if I want to look at the system that works best, it's going to be that riot of diversity. Um, and it is, it is my guiding principle as a gardener, and indeed, you know, as I look at our culture, as a citizen too. Um, that's an aspect that has made the United States as, as powerful a nation as it is, is its diversity. And it's not accidental that we've been so successful, I think, because of that diversity. And that diversity offers a depth of balance and resilience in your gardens. This was the way it was when I arrived at Highland Lincoln. A gorgeous garden that was very, very perfectly planted with gorgeous, impressive blocks of vegetables. And to be fair, lots of flowers in blocks. And there was a fair amount of diversity because of all those flowers, but the plants were very much ordered and controlled, and that was the aesthetic. I really appreciate it, but it was, certainly wasn't my style and my aesthetic. I already had developed a style whereby, because I love flowers, um, and my partner loves them even more, I made sure to have a row of flowers at the beginning of my garden, and a row at the back of the garden, and a row, I'm sorry, not a row, but at the, at the edge, at either end of every bed. And that was just for an aesthetic purpose. And I noticed as I was doing that, that I was getting lots of insect activity. And it wasn't too hard to figure out that, that insect activity was beneficial. It was at least pollinators, but even before I heard farmscaping, Back in the early 90s, I would see ladybugs preying on aphids. I would see that. And for me, that always has been thrilling. It's kind of like, I don't know, I'm dating myself, but there used to be a TV show called The Wild Kingdom, which I loved as a kid. And I had my own little wild bike in, in the backyard. And when I got to the Highland Lake Inn, all of a sudden I had a much bigger area to work with. And got there really kind of overwhelmed, didn't know where to start. It was an acre garden that was bigger than anything I had done before. I had to feed a restaurant. But what I figured out right away was cover crop every day. Don't have bare soil. Have the soil be covered by plants. And at that time, I just knew that that was one of the principles of organic gardening and that I could get that done. It was something I could do right away while I was figuring out where I stood. I hadn't realized that, that those cover crops were going to be arborage for beneficial insects. They were going to be food for beneficial insects. A lot of the cover crops have things called extra floral nectaries, um, which is pores on plants that provide nectar to, to insects even when they're not in bloom. A lot of the vetches have that. Um, also, as those cover crops become, um, or reach the point where they're going to seed, the pollen is an excellent source of food for beneficial insects. So I didn't realize that, but I was already beginning to do farmscaping by growing cover crops. Everybody who grows cover crops, how many people grow cover crops? I'm here to convince the rest of you, you can't afford not to grow cover crops. And indeed, you are missing out on a huge bargain because every cover crop you grow feeds the soil in many ways, including a very dynamic way that thrilled me when I learned about it. Um, so I got into growing cover crops. 
This is more the world that I'm used to seeing. Uh, that's a beneficial insect plant. Most plants are beneficial insect plants, by the way. But that one is anisysip. It's an incredibly beneficial insect, incredible food plant for beneficial insects. You will have insects coming to it all the time. And I particularly picked that one for the opening shot because you'll notice that there's also one of our favorite pests, the Japanese beetle there. And the reality is you cannot have a diverse, healthy garden without pests. If you don't have pests, the predators have nothing to eat. And what happens when there's nothing to eat for predators? Their populations crash. What happens next? The herbivores, the pests, boom. I think most of us learned about the hair link cycle in Canada, at least maybe not anymore, but it was a big deal when I was taking biology. And that happens in every garden. It's why organic gardeners figure out pretty quickly that they're actually going backwards if they use the broad spectrum of insecticides. Because when they wipe out all life, the first stuff to come back is going to be the pest. And there has to be enough pest to sustain beneficial insect populations before they will establish themselves. And then they have to build up to a level where they get control. The good news is that wherever you're starting, if you simply grow lots of flowers and other plants that feed beneficial insects, plants like vetch, baba beans, sweet potatoes that have extra floral nectaries, you will get the food to the beneficials and they will quickly build up the populations that provide control. And my friend Richard McDonald, Dr. Richard McDonald, also known as Dr. McBug, he has a website, once in Dr. McBug, you can go to it. A lot of what's on there is pictures that I've taken and a lot of them. Flowers recommended are plants that I passed on to Richard. But um, what he taught me, and one of my favorite things I share in almost any talk I can, there's a few things I try and squeeze in every talk. And basically, if you have a Bacone wasp that is newly hatched out, if you scout your garden, and I highly recommend that everybody does that, and really for gardeners, it's real simple. What I say is cultivate the fine art of puttering in the garden. Use your peripheral vision. Don't be directed. Just go out in the garden and take it in. And you'll start to see things. You'll start to notice things that you hadn't noticed before. And one of the things you may very well notice are little white... I thought they were eggs for the longest time. They're actually cocoons, or yellow cocoons. And they are kind of spun in, in a webbing. And oftentimes they'll be right next to or on top of a dead or dying caterpillar. And these guys are opponent wasps, and they've laid their eggs, opponent the wasps have laid their eggs in those caterpillars, and when you see the cocoons, that kind of caterpillar is either dead or about to be dead. And basically, once you have them really established and booming, they're everywhere, but to get the levels up and give you control, is it takes enough food plants. Once you have them really established, you no longer need to worry about the various cabbage worms, cross-dried cabbage worm, European cabbage worm, that are such a bother to so many gardeners. And BT, which is an easy solution for organic growers, is no longer needed, with the one exception of right when broccoli is forming its head. Because when broccoli forming its head, those beneficial insects can't find their way or don't find their way inside the broccoli head. If you don't want worms in the broccoli head, which is definitely unpopular in my family, you want to be sure to spray BT once. But otherwise, you have control simply by building up those populations. Now, if those two sisters, they're both, they're both female conan wasps, have just hatched out, right? And they take flight, right? One of them is unfortunate enough to end up in a Walmart parking lot, right? Still, she mates because that's her function, right? And she lays eggs. She lays 30 of them, okay? Um, meanwhile, the other one finds its way to this garden and feeds on that anisysip, or even more likely, on a broccoli or mustard flower. Turns out that a whole lot of the beneficial insects really love to feed on the flowers that they benefit. Makes sense, right? They lay their eggs on the pests that are feeding on that, of course, they're going to feed on the flowers too. And I stumbled into a lot of the principles that I now promote. And
And just because I like to see the whole process of plants going to seed, and I just didn't have the heart to take plants out once they were going to seed, I often let plants go to flower. And I quickly noticed that those plants were oftentimes very heavily visited by lots of tiny insects. And later I learned those were tiny wasps, things like serpent flies, that are giving control of the pests that attack those plants. So that second wasp feeds on the anisocyst or on the broccoli flower, and then she mates. She lays 300 eggs. That's the difference. If you have the food in your garden, you get that level of control. That gives you the balance you need to the diversity of plants. And that diversity of plants is a whole array of flowers. I'm not going to go into, into all of them now. That's a beneficial insect talk. You can easily go to Dr. McBug or the livingwebfarms.org, which is our website where I work. And we have a video, several videos about beneficial insects, including one with Dr. McBug. So you can get all the details at either of those two sites. But right now, suffice it to say that that incredible diversity, that riot of diversity is what gives the balance. It doesn't solve every problem, but it solves a lot. Okay, how I came to figure this out was a specific moment or figuring out how I reached the culmination of the observation I was, observations I was making and the moment where I suddenly got a passion for this and was able to teach it and was suddenly looking at it more and working with Dr. McDonald to come up with a list of plants and figure this out more deeply and just stop spraying by and large. I mean, I, it's so rare that we spray for insects. There are exceptions, and I'll mention a, a couple of those because they prove the rule. But what got me there was my own inclination to watch nature and let things be as much as possible. At the Highland Lake Inn, when I got there, there were huge beds of kale, incredibly productive beds of kale. We harvested massive amounts of kale throughout the winter, you know, hundreds and hundreds of feet of kale. It comes springtime, we were still picking the leaves. They weren't as good, but because of commitment there was to have as much food from the garden on the plate, they found creative ways to use it. I was excited when the flowers came along. I don't know how many people know this, but the flowers of kale and collards are quite delicious and quite broccoli-like. And so I went out to the restaurant to use those. They wouldn't have anything of them. They thought they were bitter or tough or something. I was disgusted, but I gave up. I hadn't become persuasive enough. And my coworker said, well, should we just cut the tops off? And I said, nah, um, we'll let them be there. And they quickly became covered up with aphids. And my coworker, Seth Crowers, was like, we've got to spray for these aphids. And I said, we don't really care. They're only on the tips, and they're going to feed the ladybugs. So we let them go. We kept picking the um, kale leaves. Finally, the kale was done. And it was mid-spring. Right next to the kale patch was a patch of potatoes. And Seth asked me if I was done with the kale. Should he mow it down? And I said, yeah. But do me a favor. After you mow it down, let it sit. Don't turn it under right away. Let the ladybugs that were feeding on those aphids get off. Right? Okay. At the same time, from my own experience, I learned that potato beetles basically hit at a certain time every year. And I've had problems with them before. And at that time, there was an organic solution. We were allowed to use a BT. No longer use it thanks to the, to the fact that it's genetically engineered now. But at that time, you could use that. It was BT San Diego and worked with potato beetles. And so, good organic grower was now a professional. I had it on my calendar, and I very proudly you know, told Seth that now is the time to spray for potato beetles. Seth, being a great grower, walked out and looked before he sprayed. Came back and said, Pat, I don't want to spray. I said, Why not? He said, Well, I don't see how many potato beetles are. There's a million ladybugs on these plants. And so I went out and looked. And sure enough, you had to look very hard to find any potato beetles. There were a few eggs. Um, there were a lot of ladybug eggs, which are similar to potato beetle eggs, but they're more, set more scattered, not as tight a cluster. Um, and the potato beetles were soft. I, at that point, went back and excitedly called Dr. Richard McDonald, who I met through Carolina Farm Stewardship. He was at that time the head of the Beneficial Insect Lab for North Carolina. And I told him that we were controlling potato beetles with ladybugs. He tells a story um, of hanging up and picking on another one of these hippie farmers, hippie gardeners. Um, one of my um, 
Many audience members who have heard this story and then laughed and said, he should talk, he's got a ponytail down to his waist. But he did make that comment. Um, and then he did his research. He learned that indeed we even shipped ladybugs to other countries that were having problems with Colorado potato beetle because in the 30s it was the solution. And no, ladybugs don't eat Colorado potato beetles, but they love Colorado potato beetle eggs and the first two instars of the larva. And so that it was the solution, and that just got Richard and myself going. That's what happens on broccoli. This happens to be broccoli rock, but it's the same difference. Covered up with aphids, booming levels of beneficial insects. If I was able to get the, the close-up picture of this, there would not only be ladybugs and ladybug larvae, but there would be serpent flies whose larvae feed on, lady, on, on aphids. Um, serpent flies and larvae would be feeding on the serpent flies. Serpent flies have to have lots of pollen and nectar to do that, though. There would also be a recorded wasp that parasitizes aphids and these lovely little golden mummies with, out of which hatch more serpent flies. So that was how I, I came to that realization. And that realization changed totally how I garden. Because all of a sudden I realized that I wanted maximum diversity and I didn't want to have a very large space between food and arborist plants. And indeed, this is not so important for insects such as circuit flies. It can fly a quarter mile or a mile easily. But it's very important for Maconid wasps, which are very tiny. And basically, if you go from your garden to your neighbor's garden, maybe half a block down the street, there'll be different genetic strains because they do not have to travel that far. They, they're very weak flyers, and without arborage and food sources, they are not going to boom, and they are not going to be able to give us the control we need. So this is the Mount Air Community Get Organic Community Garden, and fortunately, all of the organic community gardeners there also love flowers, and it wasn't hard to convince them that they should intersperse flowers into their beds. And we had, once again, virtually no problems with insects, except for the invasives. And if we were doing a beneficial insect talk, I'd talk about how to deal with those. But today, just trust me, there are ways to deal with, it, with the invasives, and you can mail me at the question and answer time. Okay, this is an example of the impact that diversity has. This picture was taken by um, Linda Blue, uh, now a retired extension agent for um, gardeners in Asheville and Buncombe County. And it's a spectacular shot because it shows two beneficial insects helping to control bean beetles. Now the truth is bean beetles are one of those exotics that are much harder to control and actually you might not even have a problem here. How many people have a problem with bean beetles? Basically, those of you who live far enough south don't have a problem because if a predator, Pediogeus bovulatus, which is a tiny wasp, a very tiny wasp from India, if it can, if the bean beetle larva can overwinter, then the predator can overwinter and you no longer have to worry about it. But for those of you that live in cooler areas where the bean beetle larva cannot overwinter, you have to worry about it. Um, so I release that predator every year. Along with that predator and this kind of incredible um, level of predation by beneficial insects we get control. Um, that two spot, that's a two-spotted stink bug that's on the left there. And it is pretty amazing because actually um, my good friend Kenny Haynes was in the field with an intern one time and the intern said, what's this? And lo and behold, that two-spotted stink bug, that tiny little bug, had its armored proboscis shoved into the space between the neck and the head of a Japanese, of, of Japanese beetle and was sucking the life out of it. Um, and it's just that tiny little beetle. And yet, when they tried to get um, local um, extension people to identify that beetle, nobody could tell, tell, any, tell Kenny what it was. They had to call Richard. He said, just look at your biocontrol book. It's on the front cover. Um, <laughs> but at that time, People just didn't believe that there were controls for beneficial insects. Richard McDonald actually convinced um, Virginia Tech to do major beneficial insect plantings and to get a grant for it, and they were very, very skeptical. Within a year, they were ev evangelical about it, and you, I couldn't see them without saying, I helped do some 
consulting and help them to figure out how to do it. Um, they, by the way, went over the top, where I would say to grow two to five percent beneficial insect plants and then counting your cover crops and your whatever weeds you have to add more of that diversity, they would they did something like 20% of their farm to beneficial insects. And every time I saw them at a conference, they would say, Pat, an acre of potatoes, no potato beetles. And I would think, you better have some. If you don't have any, you're going to be in trouble. But not enough that they, that they were concerned. And they didn't think that was possible. They thought that was just baloney. Um, but it's true. If you basically can hold your fire, that's a key piece to know, and don't eliminate the food sources, you get control. The thing about diversity is that you have to accept it. You have to let go. You have to accept that part of diversity are things that, eh, maybe not so good. Yeah. And this is the perfect example. There's two downsides to this glorious picture. That, of course, is the black or blue swallowtail butterfly, and it's young is the parsley one. I don't know how many people have seen that gorgeous big worm with the horn on it, mm -hmm. um, lime yellow and black. It's a pest. I could never spray BT to control the parsley worm. When I find a parsley worm that's doing a little bit too, damage on my, too much damage on my parsley, on my carrots, I pick them up and move them over to a clean ant's place. Fortunately, I've got plenty of clean ant's in there. And that's a good enough solution for me. The other part, that lovely flower is one that I have adored for its diversity and for its, its ease of free flowering. It's Rubina canariensis. Um, it's very free flowering. It has a, a, just a wonderful little haze of purple. And it, it, it is so um, good at volunteering that you soon end up with it all over the garden and you just weed it out where it's in the way. You give it away to your friends. I love to say that gardens bring out the generosity of people because the abundance of gardens make us always giving, make us always be gifting our friends and our neighbors and visitors to our gardens. This is one of those plants. Problem is, last spring I did a beneficial insect talk at Clemson and got to hear a disease talk, and I learned that this is an alternate host for downy mildew for cucurbits. I don't know how many of you have run into downy mildew for cucurbits, but it's a scary disease. It's a really hard one to control, and the thought that this is an alternate host almost moved me to not have it in the garden until I realized that you grow tons of cucumbers. That's a total host form, and it blows in. And so the amount that may well be lurking in my verbena venariensis is minimal. And the benefit, the benefit is huge. This plant is really not a food plant for insects, but butterflies adore it. Now, if I was just being mechanistic about this, I'd go, well, I don't really want to feed butterflies because they're either innocuous or pest, right? Cabbage butterfly, parsley worm, tomato horn worm, there are a whole bunch of butterfly larvae that feed on our plants. So why would I want to feed butterflies? Truth is, if I don't feed the butterflies, once again, I'm not feeding beneficial insects. And indeed, I had a moment in the garden where I got the car reaching up and say, I just saw my first cabbage worm going sideways through the air. Wings closed, going sideways through the air. How did it do that? It was being carried by a dragonfly. So dragonflies love and feed on butterflies. And if you have that kind of diversity, and need birds feed on them, you begin to get control. And the whole picture of control of beneficial insects is not just insects. It's birds, frogs, your grandkids or your kids at a penny a pop. All of that is biological control. And that is the diversity that gives us control. Okay, this is the other end to solving the bean beetle problem. Once again, those ladybug larvae doing it again. And then that brown cocoon there, that is a bean beetle larva that has been parasitized by Pediobius fumbulatus. So once again, diversity that occurs naturally and diversity that we introduce gives basically complete control to bean beetles and squash beetles. Kaordia. Anybody know that term? I love it. It definitely describes my gardening style. It's a permaculture term. And I think you can kind of get what it means, right? There is there's an order in chaos. It seems chaotic to us, but there's an order to that diversity. And by and large, I just try and let the chaordia happen and 
try and enhance it, and not get in the way of it, but once in a while you want to tweak it. And that is a clary sage. Clary sage is a remarkable plant for many reasons. Um, in the Middle Ages, they, they found that it helped with, with eyesight problems. That's why it's called clary. It's an incredible fixative for dyes. But in this situation, the reason why we have it, why we have it flowering, is there's one wasp that controls a huge pest, and that is the tomato root worm, also known as the corn ear worm, also known as the pepper borer. So it attacks a whole bunch of our crops, and if you have enough clary sage, you'll get high enough levels of that wasp, and you'll get control of that wasp. You won't get eradication, but you'll get control. So that's a situation where you don't just let it go, you don't just, basically my advice to people usually is, they want a formula for farmscaping, I say basically follow your heart. Plant plants that, that make your heart sing, that, that speak to you, and observe and you'll quickly learn. I actually knew that Virginia Tech was gonna be a very successful farmscaping event, I mean, project, when I was being toured by Brinkley Benson, who was at that time a graduate student and was working on it as a project. And he had, in his farmscaping mix, stevia. And I didn't know stevia very well, I had only grown it once before. And I said, so why do you have that in there? He said, oh, my son loves it. And I was like, yes, that is the right reason. You cannot do formulas. If you're trying to mechanistically figure this out, you're going to miss stuff. Nature is not formulas. All kinds of un unusual reasons end up having spectacular impacts. It turns out that stevia is one of the last flowers to bloom. And that late bloom is critical to the survival of beneficial insects. And pests, by the way. But we have to accept that. The pests and the beneficials are part of the complex. Okay, weeds. And can you read that, um, that the title of that book? Probably not, right? Weeds, Guardians of the Soil. Um, and it's by Joseph C-O-N-A-N-N-A-U-A-O-U-E-R. Anyway, if you put weeds, Gardeners of the stuff, Guardians of the Soil in, you'll find it. Um, and it's a spectacular book. And by the way, um, if you if you Google it, I actually don't remember the name of the website now, but I just noticed that it's actually a free online version. If you want to buy it from Amazon right now, it's out of print and the cheapest copy is $38. But it's an amazing book and it actually got me again how the fact that I didn't, I never have been a great reader, and I just tried to keep weed control to the level where they didn't impact um, production, and so I always had some level of weeds, and actually that's beneficial in many ways. The example he uses that's most powerful is as a young boy, he was being paid to weed a cornfield. A farmer came through about lunchtime and said, leave that pusey, which was the Midwest term for first lane, in, it's good for the corn. They weeded half, weeded half of the field already, so that half didn't have the, the purslane in anymore, but they left the purslane in the rest of it. It turned out to be a drought year, and the half of the purslane is way greener, way more vital. Makes sense, purslane is a great living mulch. Right? Turns out also that the exudates of purslane are pretty special too. Of course, it's also a wonderful edible green. Um, it's very high in omega-3 fatty acids. And that brings me to the other part, which I have to fit in sooner or later in every talk. The exudates from weeds add a diversity that's combined with cover crops and combined with the minerals that are pulled up from the depths by those weeds. Weeds like lamb's quarter and amaranth, great to leave in. Not great to let go to seed unless you want to eat them, and they're both highly edible, but great to let get to just before going to seed because they go down deep and fracture the soil and allow the much weaker vegetables to follow down deep and get the minerals. Meanwhile, all of these, the cover crops, the plants, and the weeds, are doing something very special. And I learned this from Dr. Elaine Ingham and it was revelatory to me. Basically, all plants put approximately 50 to 80% of what they photosynthesize below the soil. Of that 50 to 80 percent that they put below the soil into their roots, 30 to 50 percent of that is exuded from the roots 
to feed the microbial communities, to feed the diversity in the soil. Now, the first time I presented that to a, a man who I felt sorry for because he clearly had, should not have been doing what he had been asked to do, there was a demand for organic weed control talks. And he basically knew how to tell you how to use Roundup. And it was quite embarrassing. The extension agent was actually in South Carolina. Um, and I was attending it as part of a class, as part of our credits for our class. It was, it was really bad because we were the bulk of the audience and we were all there to learn organic. And he literally could not come up with one organic amendment that could be used to feed grass lawns and help to control weeds and nutrition. He had no idea what to use. After the class was over, I went up to him and said, what about growing clover in the grass? We're getting the nitrogen, and you know the exudates are also going to be feeding those plants. It's going to be more diversity. He said, exudates. Oh, you mean, yeah, plants have leaky roots. In his mind, they were broken. They were stupidly letting nutrients out into the soil that they should have been using to produce more of that plant. The plants had the organic dictum in their, in, their, in their genes, and they knew to feed the soil, and the soil would feed them. So that's a huge piece of it, and weeds are a huge piece of that. I actually didn't get my part of a publication that we were doing to educate people um, at one place that I was working, put in with a compendium of parts that were being written about beneficial insects because the people that are putting it together said, we can't tell farmers to grow weeds. And yet I'm going to tell you, let the wild happen. That is a critical part of the diversity. And there are, of course, a lot of people may know, without the wild edges in the Andes, we probably wouldn't be able to grow tomatoes and potatoes at this point. Because that is where they find the late flight resistance and the disease resistance we need. And indeed, that is where insects that are going to be beneficials come from, is those wild places. When your garden doesn't have much to eat, there almost certainly is food in those wild places. Let the wild go, and it happens, it works in so many ways. This is milkweed, a wonderful plant, and all of that texture in there is actually milkweed aphids. And there's a ladybug feeding on that, and if we had a better definition, better or more defined picture, we would also see other beneficials. You would see those little golden, coco golden cocoons of the uh, coloring block, all of them feeding on that milkweed. The milkweed actually not only has the milkweed aphid, but it also has the milkweed seed bug. And the milkweed seed bug, as an adult, is one of those true bugs that's toxic. It's very bright in color, nothing much eats it. But the young have not gotten very toxic yet. And ladybugs and all kinds of beneficial insects feed on the young milkweed seed bugs. And they happen in huge numbers. So between those two things, milkweed is basically the steakhouse for your beneficial insects for much of its season, both before it's in flower when it's got the aphids, and later on when it comes into flower when it has the milkweed seed bug. And there are just endless examples of that. Goldenrod is it hasn't happened the last few years, but for years and years, it was just like one of those times where I would just love to walk out in the garden, walk out in the fields, and observe the beneficial insect activity. Because there's an aphid that's very specific to goldenrod. It's the goldenrod aphid. It's big and red. And it takes basically in mid-spring, early spring to mid-spring, totally covers up the tips of every goldenrod plant. And of course, it is then covered up with beneficial insects. Indeed, at one point, my intern, who I taught, about, taught this to, stopped me and said, what's this bumblebee doing on a goldenrod? And it wasn't a bumblebee. It was a robber fly. Robber flies are the T. rexes of flies. They're incredible predators. They think nothing of landing on a bean beetle or a Japanese beetle, picking them up and flying off of them. But, of course, they're not going to bother with aphids, unless the aphids are essentially corn on cotton. And that's what happens when you have those aphids that way. And indeed, part of diversity is holding your fire and letting, uh, what's the word now? Economic, not only economic, but the production threshold levels of pests occur. If you walk out there and see aphids and you don't think they're going to impact your crop, your, your crop don't kill them. Because they are going to be a huge boost to your beneficial insect populations. So only, only fire when you have to and make sure that your, your weapon is very targeted, very specific, something like B2 
BT. Anybody know what BT is? BT is Bacillus thuringiensis, the soil bacterium that is not toxic to humans. Um, and if you spray it on plants, it's actually been killed. It's just a toxin at this point. It's no, no longer alive. But if you spray it on plants, that toxin paralyzes the gut of the worms, the cabbage worms that eat that plant. Or the, or the horn tomato hornworm, or the cupworm. Whatever, you know, lepidopter larva, the larva of butterflies and moths, whatever larva feeds on that plant, their stomach becomes paralyzed, they stop feeding immediately, and they die in a couple days. Only lepidopter that feed on those plants. So a monarch butterfly which doesn't feed, the larva which doesn't feed on those plants and only feeds on milkweed, no problem. It's not going to be hurt. But cabbage butterfly larva, going to be taken out. So that's the kind of targeted pesticides you want to use. Okay, this is the last shot, and it's just to give you the idea of how we do it at Living Lab Farms. It's mostly production in the greenhouse, and indeed there's blocks of squash, blocks of beans, but right next to it you see calendula flowers at the front of the bed, and a whole bed of buckwheat in bloom. And indeed this time of year we're planting Bachelor buttons and calendulas throughout the garden, throughout the greenhouse, and cilantro. Cilantro is one of my favorites. Basically, my joke, which I tell at every talk that I can, is that you can buy cilantro that doesn't bolt too quickly, which is a big problem for growers, right? They say they can't grow because it's always bolting, and the solution to that is to plant it all the time. But it's actually a huge advantage in the situation that I'm talking about here, because when it bolts, its flowers are wonderful for beneficial insects. And I've actually tried the slower bolting one, and indeed it is slower. It's at least 45 minutes slower. <laughs> you just basically can't stop cilantro from going to seed, and it does it very quickly. Likewise, buckwheat, both of those are a huge benefit. For, if you leave this talk and go, you're fired up, and you want to start farmscaping, you can start putting cilantro out immediately. I get them started, but they're very hardy. Put them out. They'll be going to flower by the time you have anything significant in your garden and the beneficial insects will be feeding. And then they'll go to seed, and you'll have more of them happening, and they'll be on automatic. And they're such wispy little plants, they don't really get in the way anywhere. Okay, so that's the insect aspect of beneficial insects, of, of um, diversity. But there's also the soil food web, and, and diversity in the soil food web. And Dr. Elaine Ingham is my guide on this, my mentor, um, I've actually gotten to know her, fortunately, I'm fortunate enough to uh, workshop and put together in the Ohio Lake Gate where she taught. Um, but prior to that, I saw her speak at the Echo Farm Conference in California in 1997. She totally turned my head around. That's where I learned about all of the exudates that are being put into the soil. That's where I learned amazing things like they have put a radioactive um, isotope of nitrogen into the soil and then watch how many times it was exchanged in a minute, 1,100 times. Basically, the soil light has that nitrogen in suspended animation. That's the difference between a garden that is being nurtured organically, where the light is being maximized, and a garden that is being treated with high salt fertilizers, which are toxic to um, fungi particularly, and fungi are a huge piece of this, and even worse yet, it's being treated with Roundup, because Roundup totally fries the fungal aspect. Both of these are also very hard. The high soft fertilizer is very hard to all life in the soil. So if instead, you have this incredible light, you need way less fertilizer. Indeed, a key trick is to, whenever you use any kind of fertilizer, try to include some light with the application, whether that be good compost, compost tea, inoculated biochar, whatever you have that can have, ensure that you have compost tea, whatever you have that can ensure maximum light means that that fertilizer will go way further. And indeed, in California, a lot of the smarter conventional growers are now using less fertilizer and applying a little bit of very good nitrogen. They can't use very, very good, I'm sorry, very good compost. They can't use too much fertilizer or the compost won't work. So they have to back off, and they find they get better results by using less fertilizer with a little bit of light. 
And here you see compost. We have quite a compost operation at um, Mills River Educational Farm, affectionately known as Mr. Red Farm. Um, and it's basically, we have forced air, which allows it to really stay hot. It stays hot for weeks and weeks at a time, and then we turn it to ensure that we get heating throughout the entire pile. This is very important because we make compost tea from it, and it is manure-based. Now, the FDA would just tell us, and they might actually outlaw this. We give our food to the hungry, and they might tell us that we can't do this, although we've been doing it for years, never made anybody sick. Our compost is over 132 degrees, up to 150 degrees, for anywhere from four to eight weeks. And it is turned throughout that time, many times a week. That means that we have, by many times over, hit the process of further reduced pathogens, which is a legal requirement for the use of compost in organic growing, and is now becoming a standard for all the gap certification too. And that means they require that in this kind of situation, the compost which is essentially a vessel, um, have three days over 132. Now this wouldn't quite make a vessel because it's not covered, so we do sometimes use those green fabrics over there that do cover it, and that probably would make it a vessel. But it doesn't matter because we turn it so many times that for sure we admit that process to further reduce packaging. And then we let it sit, because we're far enough ahead, for sometimes up to a year. This means that we have wiped out probably 99.9% .9 of all pathogens. And indeed, I tested, I, I, I ran a commercial compost facility for Gaia Herb Farms, and I tested my compost. I also then had a grant and did the same thing in Yancey County, composting food waste, a Diener grant, Department of Environment and Natural Resources, North Carolina. And both times I tested, I, I had to test, that was a legal requirement because I was a certified composter. And because I had to, I decided that I would learn as much as I could, so I asked them to test for a different pathogen each time. I just had to test for one pathogen each time. But I did this for several years, so I got to test for a lot of different pathogens. And invariably, the results would come back less than two, less than three. And I'd look at it and say, what does that mean? So I finally called them up and said, what does that mean? And they said, we can't find any pathogens, but we know there have to be some there. <laughs> that was the level, and there probably were, but they weren't at a level that was problematic. I'm going to talk more about that later on. Okay? But then, these pathogens, all of which, by the way, do well in mammals' guts, right? They don't do well outside of our guts. They're, an they're anaerobes, and they need anaerobic conditions to do well. They sit in a compost pile for a year, they're done. They've starved to death, they've been eaten by much more vigorous aerobes that are in that pile, and they're done. They're not there anymore. And then we make compost tea from it and have maximum microbial life on our plants, maximum microbial life in the soil. So we use our compost at this point, not heavy applications unless it's a new situation. And I'll describe one of those situations in a minute. Because I've learned from Dr. Rod Morse, basically if you use compost as a fertilizer, you're very, going to very quickly have too much phosphorus and too much potassium. Because their compost is loaded with phosphorus and potassium, and they basically are going to build up, and you're going to start to get imbalances in your soil. So when you're first starting out, a healthy dose of compost is a real winner. But as you go on, less and less, and more and more reliance on cover crops. Cover crops. This is an example. This greenhouse we just built, and we built it to use the heat from a biochar facility that we just built. And it had a lot of problems. There were some mistakes made, and say the radiant heat in the ground, and we had to be on that growing area with, with equipment for a lot of time, and we did an awful lot of compaction. And so I really wanted to break open the soil, and I didn't want to work it with machinery. I'll talk more about why I don't want to work with machinery in a minute. So what we used were oilseed radish, grape feed huge dicard kind of plants, and rye, which is noted for having really strong roots for breaking open the soil, and a very special plant called Cecilia. Canacetifolia, tansy leaf mycelium. And this is a plant that is not a legume but fixes nitrogen. It's a plant that they grow fields and fields of it in Europe because they think that the exudates that it produces are particularly beneficial to soil life. We already know that it fixes nitrogen when it's not a legume. It also is a wonderful bee plant and food plant for beneficial insects. And by the way, very lovely. It's in the same family as comfrey and borage. 
which if you've ever grown concrete boards, you know what their root systems are like. So it really helped to break the soil open. Um, to go back for a minute, we also, in this greenhouse, put biochar. How many people know about biochar? Biochar is incredibly exciting. Um, when I learned that Dr. James Lovelock came out and said, after having said in 2007 that it's all over, Dr. Lovelock wrote a book called The Diet Theory. And in that book, he talked about the fact that the Earth is a living organism. It's one organism. It totally gets that, that every piece of it is important to the health of the, of the entire Earth. And that's where he came up with the Gaia theory. And in 2007, he was interviewed in Rolling Stone, and he was quite bitter. He basically said, it's over. Too late. The color of green is the color of global corruption. There isn't any environmental thing you can do. The tipping balances are going to be so great that you will have billions dead by the end of the century and surviving populations of the polar regions. And I don't have to go into the details of that now. We don't have to argue. But that was his belief. Until he learned about biochar, in 2010 he came out and said, unless we start to incorporate biochar into all of our agricultural land. I couldn't sleep that night. Because I already felt that that was a huge piece of it. When you put biochar in the soil, if you make it a point to capture the energy from the process of making that biochar, I won't go into the details of, right now, of that right now, but you can get huge amounts of energy by burning biochar very cleanly and burning all the smoke. So you're burning all the smoke for energy. You get lots of energy. And if you use that energy, then that energy becomes carbon negative when it goes in the soil. Biochar is filled with pores. These pores are at such a level that a gram of biochar has the same surface area, area of two text cords. A square inch, two acres. That level of porosity is basically as Dr. Lane Engel would say, condominiums for microbes. Microbes are the engine of fertility. And it works like a coral reef. The light builds on that. So it goes to the soil being dynamically carbon negative. <coughs> as the light builds on it, it becomes more and more carbon negative. And there's this area in South America where they have this soil called Terra Preta, where 2,000 years ago, American Ameri Indians were figuring out that by incorporating charcoal and basically their midden pile, you know, their, their waste, their food waste, and indeed pottery, they could turn the incredibly unfertile soils of the Amazon, right? Heavy iron oxide and aluminum oxide soils that repel water, they could turn it into the most fertile soil in the world. And indeed, that soil still is still incredibly fertile from the incorporation of charcoal. And so we are very inspired by that, and we're fortunate that our nonprofit could do it. And this is Bob Wells, and he has installed three atom retorts, and we are making very large amounts of biochar, which is going to be inoculated by John Nielsen and Bob, Bob Wells and their company, and going to be made available to growers, and it has an incredibly dynamic effect. John Nielsen had a product early on, before he had a lot of charcoal, where he made an inoculant, the biochar inoculant, and he had five years of tests, it's probably more than five years now, with Dr. Ron Morris, where on the first two pickings of Mountain Fresh Tomato and Mountain Fresh Plus Tomato, which is the, the successor to Mountain Fresh, basically a 50% or greater increase in yield. And anybody who knows anything about farmers knows that the first two pickings are critical. Over the whole season, more like 10%, 12%. But even that is huge for a grower. One time, 80%. Dr. Morris won't talk about that. He's got to document that again, but it happened. You know? And those are the kind of phenomenal results you can have. This greenhouse, we built, we made the soil because it, it was basically subsoil and it was compacted subsoil. So we were lucky enough to get some pond muck. We put 30% pond muck, which is very high organic matter, into this very sandy subsoil and added two yards, or not two thirds of a yard of compost to every 80 foot by 30 inch bed. That, that compost had about 5% biochar, which was inoculated with compost tea mixed into it. This year we did a soil test. We basically are coming up on the same fertility levels as native prairie soils. The fact, I had a hard time finding the figures for native prairie soils. John Nielsen was able to help me on that. Native prairie soils range from someplace like, I think, 23 
cation exchange capacity of 26 cation exchange capacity. We are at 21 and a half. That is incredible. I mean, if, you know, if you've done soil tests, you know it's incredible. And the results are incredible. We basically, from mountain fresh tomatoes, mountain fresh plus tomatoes, we grew just as we continued Dr. Morris's testing, had 21 pounds of premium food per plant. This is a determinant plant. That's as good as a commercial grower who's moving on to just vacated dairy or cow pasture and is using a cube of chemicals a week per acre. That's the level they get of production. We gave probably six or seven compost tea feeds through the year to those tomatoes and got those results. That's the future, and that's a future that is driven by the light in the soil, by the soil diversity, and by the cover crops. We actually didn't turn any of these cover crops out there. We let them rot down in a few beds. We did work because we needed to have good seed beds, but we barely worked the top surface, and we'll show you some ideas about how to do that. Okay, this is at Virginia Tech, and um, let's see if I can make that a little bigger. You can see the red a little bit now. Hopefully, that's all crimson clover. And right on the other side of it is um, soybeans and rye, or not, I'm sorry, um, rye and peas, and that's the level of cover cropping they did. And yet, also, those, those crops are loaded with beneficial insects. I walked through that field and looked at the number of beneficial insects in that clover, so you're getting both at the same time. You're building up that diversity, and you're getting the nutrients into the soil. And you want, they, what's now becoming the way to do it, as you saw as we were doing in our greenhouse, the more diverse the cover crop mix, the more fertility. All right, compost tea. We just jumped there. Let's see if we did go back now. I have this in for a reason. Arctic humus is a solution. If you don't want to fly in the face of the FDA, but want to do compost tea, but if you think maybe they're right, maybe too many microbes is, is a threat, maybe you can't have, or if you haven't made good compost, but you want to use compost tea on things like salad mix, which scares the heck out of some people, um, you can do it with Arctic humus. Arctic humus is basically a product that is been in the soil for hundreds, more likely thousands of years, no human pathogens in it, and yet incredible soil diversity. Okay. Um, we use compost, but we have ever used Arctic humus. If I were feeding a, uh, one of those uh, homes that they have for you know, cancer victims that are provided by like the North Carolina State Place Credit Union for the families of cancer, cancer victims, I would probably use Arctic humus. I wouldn't want to take any chance that a pathogen could be passed on, you know, even one, to somebody that's getting chemo. But basically, it's another way to get that diversity. We do compost tea. When the weather's right, this year we couldn't do it because it rained so much, we couldn't get the compost tea out there. It's getting washed off as we put it out. But when the weather's right, we do it weekly. And literally, the man you see there, his name is Marshall Hagen, he came to us, he was a conventional tomato grower. He got wiped out by a crash in prices, lost hundreds of thousands of dollars in a couple of months, and came to work with us. When he first worked with us, he literally didn't believe in any of this. The first planting that he was in charge of, he used treated tomato seeds in the greenhouse. I asked him why, he said he didn't believe these products because they weren't treated. That's how much he had learned to rely on companies. Now, if you go to our webpage and look at the tour with Dr. Janine Davis and Extension Agents, you can hear him talk. It's incredibly powerful to hear him talk as a conventional grower about how deeply he believes in our fertility system. We just got more land, and next year, after doing some buildings, we're going to be doing large scale tomato production, and he is passionate about it. He wants to teach his former compatriots, the conventional growers in Mills River, which is a very large tomato grower area, growing area, that they can begin to incorporate life, diverse life, into their fertility system, save money, improve production, and begin to heal the land. It's just a joy to see the conversion. He's our compost tea maker now. For a long time, he checked with me. Now, we kind of check in once in a while, but he's on it. This year, he, with compost tea, twice, by accident, I tried to prove this before, but twice, by accident, he totally wiped out late flight once and basically set it way back another time.
Okay, worm compost is another great way to get fertility into the soil. If you use only worm castings, there is not a human pathogen or weed seed that survives their guts. Essentially, worms feed on microbes. They have gizzards like chickens, they grind them up. So what would be a pathogen gets ground up? Now, if you're careless and get the bedding too, all kinds of pathogens can be in the bedding, depend on, depending on what you put in the bedding. So I would recommend, if you were going to use worm castings for compost tea and wanted to do the very best practice, do not use manure in your worm bedding. I'm going to give a fertility systems talk after this, and I'll talk more about how to do the worm bed. But right now, just know the worm boxes are probably the easiest way for a home gardener to make really high quality soil amendments. It's much harder to hit that um, thermophilic um, process to further reduce pathogens with your compost pile. That takes a lot of savvy. You can do it. I'll teach people how to do it in the next coming class. But worm boxes, it's not hard at all. Worms do not want to poop where they eat. They come to the surface. You scrape off their casting, a nice word for poops, for poop, and you have an incredible fertilizer that's loaded with all kinds of plant growth hormones and the best humic acid you can get. You can buy humates, but humic acid they find from worm compost is the best. You can put that in your tea, incredible production. Do know that a little bit is good. Too much of a good thing can be problematic. Those growth hormones and growth aids that are in auxins and gerbilins, things like that, that are in worm, camp, worm compost, they can actually suppress growth if you got much more than 20% worm compost in a potting soil or a starting phase. So don't get carried away. You're not likely to because you need a very big worm box to get carried away. Okay, finally, how you work with the soil, how you work those um, amendments into the soil when you need to, because sometimes you do. Dr. Morris is a major leader in um, low-till organic. And he was the scientist, the go-to scientist for the no-till conventional method that is now widely, widely used throughout the Midwest and in a lot of the country, including North Carolina. He's moved to organic in his retirement. He's now a professor emeritus, which is what he wants. And he figured out quickly that you cannot be no-till as an organic grower because eventually invasive weeds will move in and you have to till. If you have to till, using something like this, this is a spading machine, works the soil much bigger motions than a tiller, that's what to do. If you must use a tiller, use it as lightly as possible. Tilling, I know the more you work it, the nicer the soil works, looks, guess what? It's not nicer, it's destroyed. Okay? And lots of times you'll see that. You till it all up, if you have any clay, there's a good rain, what do you get? Potted. So try not to work your soil, try to learn to use no-till techniques. We have a great video about that at our website. And indeed, you're not likely to buy a spader as a home grower, but this is, you can't see Cody, but Cody did this wonderful little innovation here. This is a mantis, the only way I would recommend using a mantis. I know mantises are delightful little tools, you can really get in there and kill everything everywhere, but you're just making flour out of your soil, you're breaking up the aggregate that your life, soil life has worked so hard to build. So Cody, who really wanted to use this tiller, wanted an easier uh, seed bed, but also got the principle and was real to and came up with a solution. You put those skids on so it only hits the top half inch. And you know what? The top half inch, it's okay. You can do it. You know, you're not doing that much damage to your soil. You got that fine seed bed for things like carrots. I thought that was a brilliant innovation. I'm looking forward to somebody coming out with it as an actual adapter for, for a till, mantis tiller. Because if you've been to enough of my talks, it is rusting in your tool shed. And the only way you're going to get it back is going to be by doing something like that. Okay, disease. I don't have any pictures. It's too ugly. Um, but I do have one. And that is of our dreams. What you see there is our garden this year, our market garden, where we feed the hungry. 11, 11, I mean, sorry, 11,000 pounds we grew this year for the hungry. Based most of it right there and in our greenhouses. And what you see is a whole lot of tomato promise. That promise was really not as great as we wanted it to be in terms of disease. That disease was late flight. We actually did manage to keep crops, keep crops growing, going though by using compost tea and a diversity of biological fungicides. We did get yields, but they were not nearly what we hoped for because of incredible late flight weather. That's the only picture. Otherwise, the principles, it is. It's the toughest road to hope for organic growers and it's no walk in the park for conventional growers. 
As far as safe harbors go, this is a pretty rocky one. That's disease. It's really hard to enforce, but the principles still apply. Okay. Um, interplanting. I learned this from Dr. Mark Boudreau. Um, we don't do it as much as as we should because of the convenience of harvesting, but for home gardeners, you can do it. Right after I heard I attended Dr. Mark Boudreau's talk, I went out and I planted my tomatoes with a uh, summer squash between each one. Much more space, right? We always give two feet to our tomatoes. I put a summer squash between each one. Now I got more like five feet. Way better. Um, maximizing the diverse, diverse life on the tea, compost tea. We took late white down totally once and knocked it back by 90% another time. We haven't got that figured out, but we're working on it. We're going to do it. It's going to happen. I know other people who say they've got it figured out. Um, selecting seed from a diverse seed gene pool. Find resistant varieties, select resistant varieties. That diversity of plants, that is going to, you know, if you watch your plants, you'll see which ones have been developing away from those diseases, learn how to get in control. Um, and finally, rotating fungicides. Plants are living organisms, they learn quickly how to grow around your fungicides, you build up resistance. And that diversity of fungicides is a huge solution. I won't be covering that in any of my talks today, but there's a whole workshop on our website where I cover that in great detail. Finally, human disease. It's a disturbing tale, as you've already heard me talk about, of a relatively clueless FDA with a beacon of hope and brilliant insight from a scientist. By the way, folks, that reminds me. If you've seen a number of mistakes here and you can remember what they are, write them down. The person who shows me the, the most mistakes, I'll give 15 minutes for you to consult to. Um, I did not have the time to very carefully proofread this. Okay, I just want to read this to you, and then we'll take questions, okay? I saw this when I walked through the Highland Lake End one, one day in the office, and they had a newsletter from a game ranch that was selling them meat. And it says, in a recent article magazine, Meat Marketing and Technology, it was stated that fresh meat does not contain enough harmless microorganisms to stop the growth of low numbers of harmful bacteria. We have, we have made our meat too pristine, says James M.J., an adjunct professor of biological sciences at the University of Nevada in Las, in Las Vegas. Jay has spent most of his career teaching and researching food microbiology at Wayne State University, made this comment at the Food Safety from Farm to Table Strategies for Progress Conference. For about, only about two, 20 home food, food board microbial diseases are known. If allowed to grow, helpful bacteria can fend off and powerful bacteria by producing substances that inhibit growth by competing for nutrients or adhesion sites or by creating an environment unfavorable favorable to harmful bacteria. Jay said. Jay continues, E. coli 0157 H7, that's the really bad one that kills people, right? Sends you to the hospital. Um, it did not emerge as a problem until the total bacterial counts became so low that friendly bacteria could not keep E. coli in check. Since every foodborne food pathogen ever recognized is still with us, it should be clear that we are not going to eliminate them, Jay stressed. Our best hope is to contain them. In our own, this is now the, the person who's writing the article, in our own discussion with meat inspection experts, the same concerns have been expressed. There is a growing concern that sanitization of meat of the meat supply by eliminating the very organisms that can encourage a buildup of our body's defenses and inhibit those pathogens is, is inevitably going to make our food less safe. So I want to leave it basically there. I can tell you much more of the same things happening with, with produce right now. The FDA basically thinks that the only way that it's safe to make large scale salad mix and stuff is by using things that sterilize it. It just takes one contaminated leaf to slip through that. And then all of a sudden you're inoculating this totally wide open space for pathogens. That's why, as far as I can tell, no small growers have made people sick with their salad mix, but it happens all the time with large scale salad mix. It's that microbial diversity that keeps our gardens healthy, keeps us healthy. All right, time for questions.